session will last about an hour or so, um, and it was set up really by Dan just to share his own words of wisdom throughout his own legal journey so far relating to sports law and the sports industry in general. And I kind of just jumped on board to, to help um, along the way. And also, as you can see, there's quite a lot of you on this call um, with different levels of experience from law students to graduates and professionals with many years PQE. So I would be really grateful if you could put some of the questions that you may have for Dan in the chat function. Um, there doesn't, doesn't seem to be a Q&A box for, for whatever reason, but put it in the chat function. Um, I will moderate this, um, although I'm sure everyone will be able to, to see it. And um, just to get you more involved in the conversation, I will just ask you to ask Dan the, um, the questions yourself and um yeah so that's pretty much it but i do hope you enjoy the webinar and i'll pass over to dan now for a bit of introduction and then we'll get going with the questions so over to you thank, dan. You, Jody. thank you thanks very much jody um so yeah all um well, firstly thank you very much for um for setting this up jody it's been great for um, my benefit and uh, we've been talking about trying to do something like this for a while and as one of the participants just before said a lot more people than last time well that's true because we tried to actually market it <laughs> um, a little bit this time which is great so thank you for all your help on that front um, the other thing that Josie and I had talked about a bit which we're going to try and do um, as well is I'm very keen for this almost to be the start of um, building a little community is the truth um, that ideally I don't want this almost to be a, a one-off um, that we just do once a month, but it's something that people feel that they can dip in and out of, that also people can network and connect with individually as well. So one of the ideas that we've had, and feel free to connect with Jody again after this, is to maybe set up um, a LinkedIn group with everybody so everyone can share ideas, network, introduce themselves, ask questions. I'll try and get into the, the conversation as well at different times. Um, because ultimately, um, my idea for, for this is um, to, to help um, on a number of fronts. I think firstly, um, and jody has got quite a lot of experience on this, which I think will be great and can answer certain questions too. And I think one of my colleagues, Alex, is hopefully joining us too, is, um, you know, I get a lot of people that um, have combinations of questions around um, how do I get into the entertainment sector? How do you become a sports lawyer? How do you end up working in sport? Um, how do I develop my knowledge? How do I develop my networking? Um, how do you go about doing things? How do you get to work with high profile people? All of the types of career development, self-development questions um, that over the years, I've been lucky enough to have some great mentors to, to read quite a lot, to offer some ideas. Um, and really it's to try and give um, you some tools to offer some ideas um, that, and experiences that you guys have gone through as well, but just to help in a variety of different ways. So this is the, this is the first um, iteration of, I'm not sure what we're calling it, Jody. I was like DG community, but that's a <laughs> terrible rhyme and it just doesn't sound good anyway, but whatever that, whatever that community feel is, the, the most important thing that I am very strong for is um, people thinking about other people and that is the number one number two and number three element to this which is um, try and help someone else accomplish something that they might not otherwise be able to do and that can sometimes be through a connection through a piece of advice through um, sharing some content um, and a variety of different tangible and non-tangible ways so I see loads of familiar faces among us which is great thanks everyone for joining I see some new faces which is brilliant so thank you very much for and getting involved and ultimately the idea is to spread the word about the type of thing that we're doing um, and see how you want to get involved so Jody over to you I think which was um, um, sort of coloring the first question and then hopefully we've got some questions already from people um, and then we can sort of start taking things from there this will be really embarrassing if no one asks a question after everyone <laughs> turning up so hopefully there'll be some good, hopefully there'll be some good questions I know yeah there is there's some them that came in prior to the call so after I ask the first question I'm going to go across to Ben Lefman um, to ask his question so you planted some questions I did so hopefully he's on he's on the call so he can go after um I've asked the first question, but the first question that we kind of get a lot of is, does Dan or does Sheridan in general offer any internships or, or work placements? So I want to pass it over to you. Yeah, and it's actually a really good place to start to a degree because 
I obviously get this quite a lot and I know a lot of lawyers get this an awful lot and I know an awful lot of professionals when um, students, people wanting to get into the profession, etc., are reaching out and are thinking that um, the, 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 a positive way to be able to engage with people. And the reason why I wanted just to start there on that particular point is I think a lot of people um, think that because it's relatively easy to be able to contact somebody like myself, like lots of people that are on this call, lots of professionals in the space, um, that that is um, the most efficient way of being able to grab attention. And I don't what I mean by grab attention, but what I also mean in terms of then it will be read, that it will be understood, and then it will be actioned. And the reason why I say all of that, um, and it fits in with this idea of helping to thinking about others, um, is, um, and I know there are certain particular procedural routes for being a lawyer, as you know, Jody, and um, lots of different ways to be able to make applications, etc. But when we're talking about sport and sports industry and entertainment industry and the job markets generally, if you're making a speculative application for something, a speculative idea um, about wanting to engage with someone, my view is to work backwards from the ultimate objective. And the ultimate objective is for the person that you're writing, speaking, communicating with to type three words or rather three letters, which is Y-E-S. How do you get the person that you're asking for a response from to say yes? And usually the way to be able to say yes is not by saying, please find this uh, generic email um, platitude. Um, I really like working in the sports industry. Please find attached my generic CV that I haven't given much thought to as to why I'm messaging and emailing you directly, but please give me a job or internship for my CV and benefit. And, and what I mean by that is I'm sure everyone's intention is pure and proactive and well-intentioned. Actually, what you've got to think about is the other person intently. You've got to think about the recipient, about all their day jobs, all the stuff they're doing every day. Think about all the emails they're getting and then thinking about this type of email coming to them where if they are having to action something by way of, oh, okay, how do I even think about starting to get this person work experience because there will be a lot of add at least a huge amount of administrative steps involved is to think what would be useful for this person that I can offer them flip the conversation from what can you the recipient do for me the person that wants the work experience to what can I the person that wants that work experience helpfully do for you and I'll just try and put a bit of meat on bones and give one or two examples. The, the most straightforward one that I see a lot of the time <clears throat> is, you know, lots of people, because I work with lots of football agents and players will say, Dan, I really want to be a football agent, but I've applied to 50 football agencies um, and I haven't had a single response. And that might well be because lots of different reasons but it is likely to be because they have done exactly that process. They have sent a CV saying how passionate I'm about football and how I want to be a football agent and how I want to work with high profile celebrity footballers. And please give me a chance. The pity, I don't mean this in a poor way, the pity narrative of please help me needs to be reversed and inverted to, I know you are very busy doing these five things. Can I help you with one of them? And all I need is a yes. So, for example, can I pick the boots up from Puma that I know you might need in three weeks for this uh, that under 16 year old player and deliver them to their house? And maybe in the meantime and in four, four weeks time, I will come be able to go to a game with you to be able to actually rack your brains about a particular thing. You've got to do the easiest thing that will make the easiest response possible. And maybe we can go from there on some things, but it's a really, really important mind shift. If we're talking about formal applications for to become an investment banker, I'm completely with this whole having to put your CV in a cover letter and all the rest of it. But if we're talking a lot about the entertainment sectors, which specifically I think are set up for um, networking, proactivity, starting at the bottom sometimes, showing real value, thinking about the other 
um, embracing your passion and curiosity in lots of different ways. I'm just seeing Jason um, Finnegan on the call, for example, that is a great um, um, agent in loads of different respects. And I'd be really interested, Jason, in maybe your views a little bit about it. But my view is you've got to invert the conversation. You create your network, you create your worth, you build your knowledge by not necessarily doing the glamorous stuff for quite some time sometimes, but by thinking about what the other person needs showing willingness, showing proactivity, resilience, perseverance, by building trust, all of that type of stuff. And by doing that in some respect, I think you get a much better chance of getting your foot in the door. So maybe that's the first place to, to kick off on. Yeah, I think you're 100% right. And I think it's, um, I mean, I certainly, as in my case, like it, you don't get everywhere the first time that you ask for something either. Like yeah, sometimes you have to keep going and keep going and keep persevering. And then eventually, you know, you, you'll, get, you'll get there. But don't take, you know, if no one replies to you, don't take it, you know, personally, because it's probably not personal. Um, yeah. But I would also say there, Jodie, which is an interesting point, is most people won't respond, is the yeah. truth. But I think then you've got to consider some A-B testing or A-B-C testing, which is, okay, this approach isn't working for me. And it might be because of me or it might be because of them. But if it's because of me, what can I what can I do to change things up a bit? And again, I'll just give one very brief example that I, I, I um, when I was doing some interviews for um, a book idea I've been having on this exact career um, um, uh, conversation, which was um, uh, a, a sports agent said that, um, you know, they're, they're getting 10, 20 emails a day sometimes from people wanting to become sports agents, um, which are obviously difficult to be able to. Um, deal with because they've got their jobs and the rest of stuff going on um, but what what struck in the conversation was that he said that actually one day he received a letter in the post from somebody who said dear such and such um, I'm fascinated by the work that you've done with these three players and the commercial deals you've done with such and such um, I don't uh, I don't we don't need anything from you at the moment but I was wondering whether there's anything that um, I might be able to help you with, for example, do this, do this, do this, more than happy to have a chat or a conversation and see what might happen as a result of it. And the fascinating thing with that on a few ways was create as many options as possible for the person to say yes. But more importantly, that attention window was completely different. Now, if you consider, if everyone considers how much, how many times they actually receive a letter these days, I know from my experience in the office, I very rarely receive a letter. So when I receive a letter that's, um, uh, that's um, posted to me, I'd be lucky to maybe get one or two a week is the truth. Um, I'm going to open it and see what it says. And that attention window compared to the electronic attention window that's, that's email, that's attachments on email, that's Twitter, that's LinkedIn, that's Instagram, that's TikTok, um, that's um, Snapchat, that, and all of the notifications that come within then, that, that window and that distraction, electronic distraction window is massive. So I love the way that the person told me the story about how they got through the electronic clutter by going direct and writing a handwritten letter to this person. And it ultimately worked. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's fascinating. I think there's plenty of different things that you could do to grab someone's attention other than just bombarding them with with genetic emails, um, as you said. And um, I don't know if you wanted to start by just kind of talking about your actual career as, you know, where things have kind of gone from where you started I know a lot of people know all about you already but for those who maybe don't really know I don't know if you want to give an overview as to where you started off to where you are now I'll just give maybe a brief minute because I actually want to make sure that hopefully there's an, um, people that want to ask some good questions and then if we if we need to fill some time yeah, <laughs> then <right>. we can <laughs> then I can I can talk for hours on myself is the, um, <laughs> is the, is the truth um, but the, the the short answer is I I've always been a football nut. Um, I'm a Liverpool fan, still a season ticket holder when we can actually maybe go back to watching um, football at some point. Um, I did a, a law degree at Manchester University. I did a master's degree in competition law and football broadcasting rights. Um, I then did a second master's in competition law for the first main job as a lawyer that I, um, that I undertook. Um, I worked, have worked in probably about eight or 10 different sectors um, from automotive industries to agriculture to financial services to um, airlines to um, uh, sport and media and over the last decade or so I've, I've sort of made the transition to, to more in relation to sport and specifically into football 
and um, through lots of different um, ideas, objectives, plans, luck, um, preparation, all of the above, um, I've managed to build a good good relationships with a number of you know, long-standing clients. And um, as a result, my idea really was to try and share some of the um, ideas with everybody because, you know, a lot of it um, is very much everybody sees the outcome. Everyone sees the, the, the person, you know, in the Instagram photo that's airbrushed, that looks amazing doing the job that everybody wants. Um, but the, the glory and the glamour actually is in a lot more in the process. And I'm just trying, I, and we've talked about it a lot, trying to demystify the process a little bit more so that people enjoy um, how enjoy that process of getting somewhere. But most importantly, understand that there's a long practice and process to getting there. And you've got to put in place those wheels, those objectives. Um, those plans, those daily habits, that consistency, all of that type of stuff that I know, I know you've done. Um, and actually, I'd like to just reverse the question for you for a second, if that's all right, Jody. Which is yeah. because we've chatted quite a bit um, at different times, and and obviously you were you did the you were um, joined my YouTube course on the career stuff a while back. Can you tell me almost what, a couple of the things that you got out of that? But more importantly, the the knowledge journal and the stuff that that you did as a result, perhaps that you can share with everybody. Yeah, um, so yeah, I did. I joined in Dan's YouTube um, courses at the start of lockdown. Um, I think, to be honest, you just you kind of almost have to be committed to doing these things. You've got to set a set time. If you want to do something, you have to do it. So the hour or so that it was, um, you know, in, in a week or so, sit down and do it. And Dan gave often like great advice, especially with like the knowledge journal, which involved looking at three articles a day from any kind of platform and kind of reviewing them and then reaching out to the author or um, anybody who, who'd written the, the post just to build up a bit of a connection and also that kind of broadens your own um, you know insight into the sports sector as well because there's a lot of a lot of sports law in essence is quite niche it's actually quite wide as well there's so many things that are ongoing um, so to even spend like half an hour or an hour off your day and I know everyone is really really busy but to be honest people can spend half an hour scrolling on social media or like TikTok or whatever and to, you can use that time otherwise you know to, to just even half an hour a day just to read articles um particularly what I thought was a really good site and I'm not, not going to plug but I use Law and Sport quite a lot I know Dan and I have both used Law and Sport and that's a really good resource for a lot of articles that kind of come up but also Dan has got a few I think three or four um on your YouTube channel now that you can all that are still there that everyone can could go and watch um so so yeah I think to be able to put habits into place and just I think, to be honest, for me, starting off at the start is actually the hardest thing because it's something new and you've got to be committed to doing it. And then the longer you do it, the easier it becomes. So um, my knowledge journal, I mean, it's been going on for months and months now, but right at the start, it was it took me a while to do. Then I was like, oh, I'll just spend 10 minutes doing that or I'll just spend 15 minutes doing that. And then it just builds up as part of your day. It's part of your routine. So you just do it. And then, yeah, so the first step is always the hardest, but keep going and it gets it gets easier. No, thanks for that. And I might just ask one thing because I'm just seeing it a little bit in the chat and I really like it, which is if you feel comfortable, just put in the chat, even if it's just for taking 20 seconds, who you are, um, what stage of the career you're at and maybe your LinkedIn profile. Because, you know, my idea generally is that um, we build something quite fun by these conversations and um, that it's not just, you know, Jodie and I chatting, but actually I'm positive if everybody does this well, um, that actually there'll be some great connections to be made between us all. Yeah. Um, we did, um, I did a networking event with Dr. Urquhart Sogut, who's Meza Erzl's agent um, alongside others. And the brilliant thing that came of that was just, obviously everyone's looking and interested in the talks, but actually people innately want to be able to connect with people um, and connect with people in the right way. Um, and that obviously leads to all of these exponential opportunities. And that's actually, I think, the, the beauty of doing this. Hopefully you get a bit of insight, but actually you get to connect with a plethora of... Um, yeah, of and I think it's important to note as well that like networking does take time. It's not something that could happen over a day or a week. I mean, networking, to build up a network takes months and months and months and you have to just keep going with it. But it's, um, yeah, it's 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 very, very worthwhile to do. But just seeing a comment in the chat from Graham Horseman who said he's happy to add to um, a comment on a topic Daniel's speaking about. So Graham, if you want to unmute yourself or put yourself on video, feel free. 
Uh, hi, hi Jody. Hi, hi Daniel. Uh, I don't think we've met before. Um, I'm a solicitor at Harper McLeod in Glasgow. We've got a quite specialised sports department, so I do quite a lot of contentious sports work, um, quite a lot of disciplinary hearings, this kind of thing for uh, a variety of Scottish and, and British sports people and sports organisations. Uh, I went to university with, with Jody as well, so um, we know each other well. Uh, I just thought I'd add to Daniel's comments very quickly and Jody, what you're saying as well is ch chimes with me too. I'm about four years post-qualified as a solicitor um, and I've worked in a variety of different departments doing a variety of different things. My practice is very broad. It's not just related to sports work. So the point I thought I'd add to what Daniel was saying was that I think when you're approaching people to try and see to get into the industry, whether it be as a lawyer or, or elsewhere, and you're offering them, what, what can I do for you? Bear in mind that it might not be predominantly sports things that you can do for them. So, so don't always focus on necessarily offering or showing an interest in necessarily sports stuff. For instance, Daniel's firm, I know, does a wide range of areas of work. And as Daniel said, he, he's had to work in a wide range of areas of work as well. And I'm the same. Um, you offer your services as to whatever the experiences that you've got in whatever it might be, because it might just be that you get your foot in the door doing something else, not necessarily sports work, mm -hmm. and you work your way through. For instance, I started out doing personal injury work and then was promoted internally into a different department that dealt with sports-related stuff as well. Uh, a colleague of mine who, who Jody knows, uh, Laura McCallum, too, she, she worked in the same department as me, and has gone on and is now um, in-house legal counsel for Dundee United FC as well. So the paths are very different, but don't necessarily restrict yourself to just doing um, um, things to do with sport or offering your services in terms of things to do with sport. Hope that's helpful. Sorry to, to really butt in. It really no, is. That, is, that is so very helpful. And I think from um, Graham's point of view and my point of view, especially in Scotland, like sports law isn't really a thing. Like um, in Graham's firm, Harper McLeod are probably the only firm in Scotland that has any sort of arm to doing a lot of sports law um, type stuff. Whereas in England, there's like 40 or 50 firms that, you know, have massive sports law mm -hmm. sectors. So it is, um, you, you're right with what you're saying. It's just kind of getting your foot in the door and offer, offering your services to whatever you can do. And then once you're there, you can maybe then offer your services to a different department, different group and just kind of go from there. So yeah, that's, that's good advice. Thanks very much for that, Graham. Really, really helpful. And I think, no um, and I think one of the other things that I was just going to mention as well, um, Joe, Dan, it was Graham's point as well. But to everyone else is, I think what's really important sometimes is that there's an over overemphasis on the sector, i.e., sport or entertainment or whatever else it might be. I can only speak from my experience as a, as a lawyer, but I know it to be the same for marketing or accounting or PR or whatever. Lots of different broad um, job skill sets which obviously feed into lots of different sectors my view and i know we've had this conversation quite a lot jody is i think the very most important thing is to become a very good lawyer or to become a very good accountant or to become a very good general agent or to become um, a very good marketeer or a very good pr expert um so you, you develop your skill set above your sector competence. Now, I'm not saying you can't do both at the same time to a degree, um, but ultimately I think I've got to be a very good lawyer first in order to become a very good sports lawyer, not the other way around where I need to be a very good sports lawyer to become a very good lawyer. So I think the breadth of my, um, exactly to Graham's point, the breadth of my um, uh, um, skill set, bearing in mind, my competition law background on regulations, on contract, on disputes, on IP, on all of those type of things held me in very good stead for then getting deeper and narrower as um, a football and sports lawyer. But that was only through um, actually me thinking about in the past, if I could have done straight away, as soon as I was a qualified lawyer, I was like, I want to be a sports lawyer. I want to be a football lawyer. That's all I want to do right now. But in hindsight, looking back, being able to, um, uh, to it, it grow my skills in lots of different sectors through lots and lots of different types of work was hugely more beneficial than narrowing myself um, as early on. Yeah, yeah, I totally, I totally agree um, with that and with what Graham said as well. Absolutely, totally agree. Um, who, who are you going to pinpoint for some questions? Ben, I, Ben Lechman. I think he's on the call. I think he. Uh, ben, if Jody, you are, can I just up. interrupt a second? 
Push kind. Yes, sorry, for Daniel, also being a very good listener, listening to the client. I've always been from day one. Once you understand what the client requires, then you can use your skill sets to obviously point the client in the right direction. But I've all, my, my whole career, as I've, as I've said to everybody, the client is number one. I listen to the client first, then I apply my skills and my knowledge, my expertise to, to robustly create the type of service level that the client requires rather than what I want. And I found just a simple equation, just simply listening to the client, you'd be surprised how much more easier um, a job becomes. That's all I wanted to say. No, thanks, Nuno. And it's a, it's a very good point. I recommend um, to everybody uh, one particular book, which I thought, which I hoped I should have got some commission on uh, because I recommend it so often. <laughs> but the book is called How to, it's a, I don't think it's the greatest title in the world, but the contents of it is just phenomenal. It's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, and I know I've told a lot of people about um, this book and I go on like a broken record sometimes, but that if I was to sum it up in one sentence, it's exactly as Dino said, which is, it is how to not only listen better, but to think about the other person from the other person's point of view. Yeah. And when you're able to do that over a long period of time and actually really understand what the other person, whoever that person is, needs and requires, you become a much more valuable and valued um, individual because you don't sell and portray what you think people want, but you are actually telling people based on your understanding of what they themselves need rather than guessing. And that exactly. is uh, that's a really important attribute that I would really um, a book, but also an attribute to, to, to think about. Um, go for it, Jodie. Yeah, ben, sorry, it's over to Ben. Um, I think I saw him on the call. So it's yeah, yeah, um, really a perfect pipe on yeah. questions. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Judy. And thanks you know, to both of you for taking the time and the advice and obviously Graham and Dino as well. Um, I'm sort of having some difficulties with my with my camera this month, so I think we'll just have to deal deal with my voice. Um, I'm just going to sort of steer the conversation away from career advice to a specific issue, if, if that's okay. Of course. Um, I was wondering if we could touch on the new sort of spiraling craze of, of NFTs, of non-fungible tokens. Um, as someone who's a Kings of Leon fan, uh, the use of NFTs was sort of brought to my attention earlier this month. Um, when they were watching the limited number of albums, and also I think they did six digital tickets as well. Um, for life as non-fungible tokens. And I know Sheridan's obviously published an article about NFTs earlier this month, but I thought it'd be interesting to hear your sort of hear your thoughts on the commercialization of NFTs um, and maybe more generally bring NFTs to the attention of some, some others in the group who might not be aware of the craze. Oh, it's a great question. Um, I am not professing as yet to be an expert, but what I'm going to try and do is... Um, talk about two particular things, one about NFTs particular and one about um, the idea of NFTs as well. So if I just first go on the idea of NFTs um, and not talk about NFTs particular and then go on to that specifically. Um, I said to one of the guys in our office uh, two months ago that um, NFTs, I thought, were um, my FFP. And the reason why I say that is that uh, it's, a, it's an odd analogy, but um, 15 years ago or so now, when the financial fair play regulations came out, um, I uh, decided that I was going to try and become an expert in the financial fair play regulations as quickly as possible. Um, and that was at a time when I was just trying to start out and get more involved in the football and sports industry space. Um, but what was happening was because those regulations were completely new, this, I was at a standing start from every other in industry individual, especially when I was much more junior in the space, which meant that um, I almost then has a head start because I had more time to be able to invest in a particular deep and narrow topic of FFP. And what that meant over time, I, I gave myself about six months to basically read everything I could on it. Um, think about it, read about it an awful lot, and then start putting comment out there about why I thought what I thought the issues were, for example. And the reason why the question is a great question as well is because I think sometimes people are thinking, oh, I need to become the best sports lawyer in football transfers, or I need to become um, a brilliant music lawyer, or whatever else that might be on copyright issues. Now, that might well be the case, but I think sometimes there are 
fan fantastic opportunities that um, that um, that become clear and open for people, especially for younger generations, to become uber experts or relative uber experts more quickly than sometimes what would otherwise be more established experts because you have the benefit of opportunity cost the opportunity cost for me to learn very much about nfts is extremely high because unfortunately and it's a great thing i've just got tons of stuff going on never mind work and never mind family and the rest whereas 15 years ago i didn't have as much as that and what happens then as a result is that if you can become a deep and narrow particular subject sector expert on NFTs um, inside six months, um, it becomes an amazing business development opportunity to be able to explain to people, it might be your family, it might be on Twitter, it might be on a TikTok video, it might be on LinkedIn, you might start creating content about why you think something is particular in a certain field. So the great question, so that's, the, that's what I mean by um, uh, a systemic point in a way, which is, I'm going to talk about NFT a little bit from the from my understanding, at least that I've garnered over the last few months. But a really important developmental point is to always keep on the lookout for new topics which you can really invest in that you know are going to have longevity and controversy and widespread appeal because quite quickly you develop, you can develop. And this isn't, by the way, excuse my language, bullshitting and um, trying to, um, and trying to um, bluff um, expertise and knowledge. This is through deep learning over a period of time to, to become a junior expert in something after spending hundreds of hours reading and doing and thinking and speaking and all the rest of it. So that's the first thing about NFTs. It's an amazing developmental opportunity for lots of people to get up to speed very quickly and become actually very knowledgeable about something which is relatively new. The second thing on actually turning to NFTs is, you know, until Topshop happened really and some digital art gets sold um, and um, a, um, someone uh, and, and, and a Twitter post um, um, sells for almost $3 million, everybody sees the artificial uh, faux controversial headline of this is so ridiculous um, and feeds into the ridiculousness timeline of this is so unbelievably stupid that people are doing this that it garners interest whereas actually the non-controversial element of all of this and I'm not the bitcoin and crypto expert but I do believe I'm a rights um, um, uh, copyright and intellectual property expert to a degree is what sits on top of the Bitcoin smart contract crypto um, token, which is the right to be able to exploit something which will create value. And my, my view, just like most people's views at the moment, is 97% of everything NFT will probably fall flat on its face because there isn't the scarcity, there isn't the know-how sometimes, not that I'm the expert, but almost as importantly, there isn't the, what will be high legacy, um, celebrity, big rights holder buy-in just yet in order to make things very scarce, memorable and worthwhile. Um, and so as a result, the controversy is being driven by a, a mainstream media that is you know, run by older people that can't get their head around the fact that people have been buying skins in games for the best part of 15 or 20 years. And when I mean skins, that's in-game purchases to be able to provide some type of utility. To my eight-year-old daughter who um, plays Roblox a lot and buys Robux in order to pay, use in-game purchases, the idea of a digital NFT asset to be able to buy, but is only available online in a particular silo, in a particular platform, is the most natural, obvious and common occurrence that they would probably imagine. For anyone 30, 40, 50 plus, who doesn't live or play a considerable amount of their time in the digital space, it's a complete anomaly. And somebody that thinks it will be um, the next big fad. Now, the question is, on a 
um, I heard Gary Vaynerchuk discuss about this, so I can't take credit for it. He was talking about the fact of the macro and the micro. On the micro, there's going to be tons of blood, is the truth, NFT blood. <laughs> Things are going to go terribly wrong for a lot of people. But for the, the minority who get it right at the macro level within a period of time, there's obvious huge benefits that can be attracted to bands, to talent, to rights holders like NBA that have done it brilliantly so far, that people can actually own a digital token of something pretty, either notorious, unique, um, rare, and or hopefully a combination of all of the above. And so I'm absolutely fascinated at trying to get up to speed more with NFTs because it cuts across so many of my sweet spots, rights holder, talent, sport, esports, entertainment, music, um, and, and everything else. So I'm sorry I've given quite a long-winded answer to um, the NFT question, but I'm, I am all over NFT for learning more about it at the moment because it's, it's a very cool space right now. Thanks, Dan. Do you want to ask your second one, Ben, or is one? Uh, I mean, I, I, I can do if, if, you, if you'd like, if anyone else has a question, maybe. Go for it. Go for it. Uh, yeah, cool. Uh, the other one was, I think you just sort of touched on that one of your, maybe you said expert areas, I think I heard you say that, um, is, was, was eSports. Um, so I think we sort of all know how lucrative sort of Premier League TV right deals are and how important they are within the sort of football ecosystem as it stands today. And I'm just wondering, sort of given the rise of esports and the gradual transition of consumer habits from pay-per-view to streaming sites like Amazon, how do you how do you see the state of Premier League broadcasting rights? And do you sort of see them as being in danger? And if they are, what impact do you see that as having on, on clubs and the ecosystem as it stands? Oh, don't get me started on this, man. I mean, this is <laughs> like, yeah. Um I'll, I'll just try and give a short answer on that um, because, I, you know, maybe we can chat offline about this because um, it is so nuanced and I've got so many um, v different views on it. But I think it all comes down to attention at the moment. I think the world is changing exponentially and that um, the, 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 the transition from pay to OTT and to streaming and to the ubiquity of being able to access something easily and relatively freely is changing the world massively. You know, you talked about esports. Esports has come bottom up just as football did 50 years ago, which is easily accessible via Twitch or whatever else it might be uh, without cost in the beginning at least, or without the opportunity cost of paying a pay TV subscription, which gathers big, huge, massive eyeballs. And those eyeballs um, attract, are, are attention, a laser focused attention on particular, um, on particular platforms and on particular sports. And I class esports as, as a sport. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that I think football to a degree has a long-term problem because um, it is not ubiquitously available anymore. It is not available to the masses in the way that it was 25, 30 years ago. And if you look at the subscriptions that, for example, Sky has, it's quite heavily age dominated from 40s upwards, whereas everyone below and Sky and others are having to change their their plans through Now TV and otherwise is people aren't necessarily subscribing, not necessarily because their attention span is, is decreased. I completely disagree on the whole attention span thing. You tell me a, um, a kid that isn't on Fortnite for eight hours a day, and I'll tell you about where their attention span is. But the question actually is, is that they haven't, um, they haven't ultimately had the chance to become entranced by something like football because it's been behind paywalls for so long and because it is quite expensive, that then their attention is drawn to other things. And, you know, my view is on, on the rights point, I know it's a, a quite an odd thing to say, I think the Premier League is competing with, um, competing with Fortnite. 
I don't think, you know, for attention and, and, and it's this entertainment explosion, Netflix uh, and everything on demand straight away is obviously a different market to live sport. I completely agree. But in the end, there is no market for live sport if nobody wants to watch it in the first place. So I know that there's, I'm covering loads of different things at the same time, but I'm just trying to see things from a quite a, uh, a helicopter um, position, which, which, which hopefully makes um, a little bit of sense. Yeah, no, that's, def that's definitely really interesting. Thank you. And from that point of view, talking about visibility and things like that, especially like this week with like women's sport, when we saw that the deal that Sky Sports have got with BBC on free to air, like for women's sport, showing like the WSL, um, back um, plays the Women's Super League in, in the UK, that'll probably become, well, certainly in a commercial aspect, like the biggest deal in the world for women women's sport. So, um, yeah, it's probably come, in my opinion, 10 or so years too late, but it's better now than, than now than never. And I think if shown that, you know, you put sport on BBC free to air, you get millions of people watching it. Like there is a demand for it, but you're right, you are competing with all the other subscriptions as well, Sky, BT um, and, and whatnot, but pros and cons to both. Well, Jodie, the interesting thing there is, um, it's a great point, you know, Sky have got that, but BBC do, and the rest are on the, the FA player, if I remember, if I remember correctly. Yeah, correct, what yeah. I mean is there's still a decent amount of games and content and access that are not necessarily behind a paywall. 100%. Now, that's yeah. every rights holder's choice to be able to decide what they want to do. But, um, you know, that, that digital attention um, is finite to a degree, is the truth. Yeah, I think the BBC are showing like maybe 18 or so games, and I think the Sky have got maybe... 30 or 40 and I think the other 75 are on the FA player um, I think but Sky have kind of come to the agreement that they're doing the whole build up thing as to do with the men's game you know like all the analysis all the commentary all that kind of stuff and I, I think that's really good for, for the game and for the profile of the players but also on the back of that you'll get sponsorship right, like deals you'll get commercial deals like there's so many amazing things that can come from just having these things on this platform so I'm looking forward to seeing how that kind of progresses um, in the coming years. Saying, Daniel, did you not mention the digital future in your book, Dundil, of the supporter at home, rather than going to a football stadium, the future was going to be the digital side of things? I'm sure you mentioned that in your book. Yes, yeah, so there's a bit about AR and uh, VR, exactly right. So, um, yeah, thank you for the plug. <laughs> um, ex exactly right. Um, it's just, you know, digital consumption um, is changing everything. I mean, it's obviously the, probably one of the most obvious things anyone can ever say. But, um, you know, when you look from a, a, a macro perspective and then you think about micro, um, you know, we've seen in the last year when fans can't go to games, what, what happens um, as a result. But what I'm thinking about there is not necessarily the, the, the verticals, but the horizontal, which is the actual viewing experience will change quite considerably, I think, yeah. in, in time. And I think that's the uh, that's the interesting element of it all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Jodie. I'm just, looking at, I'm just looking at the question box. Um, there's one coming from Liam Walsh. Uh, I don't know, Liam, if you want to put your mic or your camera on to ask Daniel a question. Hi, guys. Can you hear me OK? Yep. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dan and Jodie, for taking the time. Um, it's been really great so far, and I've found the... Stuff like TV rights really interesting. I'd like to see a move towards a kind of Premier League Netflix um, type vibe of sort of a seven or eight pound a month, but every game streamed of every club. And I think when we move to game uh, fans being back in the stadium and not every game being on TV, there might be that appetite for them to come back. But um, but yeah, that was really interesting. Thanks. Well, my question was uh, for Daniel, if that's OK, was kind of when we're looking at football clubs um, and the potential increase of legal work moving forwards, do you see the appetite being of football clubs increasing their own in-house legal team and expanding those? Or do you see them more leaning on out of, um, out of club and sort of law firms such as yourself? That's a great question, Liam. I'm sorry I didn't spotlight you in time, but apologies. Um, but uh, it's funny you say that actually, because... About about a decade ago, when I was trying to get more into the, um, the particularly the football space, um, I was building really good relationships in clubs, um, but unfortunately, was getting no work from them whatsoever. <laughs> is the truth, um, and the the issue um, the issue that I realised was that um, in a way, 
the, the way that clubs resource legal, firstly internal, as they were building and building more internal resource and recruiting uh, lawyers to be able to fulfill, you know, if it was contractual stuff, if it was intellectual property stuff, if it was IP um, and uh, disputes um, or corporate or, you know, particular procure procurement stuff. Um, that was a lot of it was being in done in house. Uh, and what I felt was, is that if I was going to get work, it was going to be extremely bumpy um, and quite reactive. Um, so I felt like I developed really good relationships, but ultimately wasn't wasn't getting too much joy. And what I, I ended up doing was, um, uh, I guess, in, in par parallel and in tandem was just developing very good, as good a relationships as I could with agents and players. So that actually I realized that if, for example, there was a deal going on, a transfer, a renegotiation of a contract, um, an image rights deal, a brand deal, disputes or other stuff that was happening. Um, at least on the positive deal side, no one would mind paying lawyers as much if everybody was benefiting out of the, the transaction was the truth. Um, and because less agencies, that's less the case these days, actually had in-house lawyers. They were happy for me to connect with them to a degree and then work with alongside them so that they didn't need internal resource, but then they could work alongside me. And that's how my sort of model um, evolved over time. I would probably say most Premier League uh, clubs have at least one lawyer, I would say now. Um, Manchester United have, I think, 10 at last count is the truth. Um, and um, I, I, I work alongside them on the variety of deals when I'm working on the, with the player and um, uh, an agent side. So um, evolution of club, I, I agree. I, I think there will always be positions for lawyers um, at clubs. It just ultimately sometimes depends on what their role will be at that club. Is it a purely contractual role? Is it a procurement role? Is it an intellectual property and commercial contract role? Is it something else? But it's by building those relationships internally, usually by negotiating against them on stuff that then you can understand that those sort of dynamics. That's really helpful, thank you. And just looking at the question box, we've got one coming from Ashot. Do you want to put your mic and camera on? Ashot. Yes, uh, hello. Excuse me, English isn't my first language. It's my third language, actually. So the question is, uh, Daniel, uh, it's interesting to know your own personal approach on the TPO and TPI regulation restriction in RSTP, which is very controversial because it's, it actually contradicts with the economic freedom and many clubs, many, especially in Brazil area, they uh, have their own negative approach on that. So what do you think about this topic in short, your own personal opinion on that? Thank you, Ashok, for the question. Um, I, there's no apologies as to language. I, I wish I had three languages to be able to speak, um, <laughs> never mind just English. So I th it sounds like your English is as good as mine is the truth. Um, the uh, Great question. So just briefly for everyone that might not uh, know, um, third party investments slash third party ownership was a, a relatively controversial um, activity that was outlawed by FIFA in 2015. And it came around in different ways because if everyone remembers um, Carlos Tevez or Javier Mascherano, yeah. um, they were involved in controversial deals when they moved from Corinthians to, to West Ham um, a good few years back now. And um, the, the byproduct of that and a number of other deals was um, uh, a number of regulatory integrity of competition issues whereby um, there were contractual provisions in agreements between clubs and third party owners, um, whereby a third party company could own a future transfer value stake in or transfer fee in a football player. And that was deemed to be problematic because the incentives of the club might be not to sell the player, but to keep the player. Uh, and the incentives of that third party company might be the exact inverse to maximize the value of an increase in value of that player if they've played well and sell them on for profit. And there was questions about um, the integrity of those types of um, dealings to the extent that it was banned 
by the Premier League and the EFL after the Tevez and Mascherano affair. It was then banned by a number of national leagues um, and then was banned uh, by FIFA globally in 2015. And um, where Ashalt has got a very uh, important point to raise is for a lot of particular um, territories and leagues and clubs, that was seen as their competitive advantage, just as in the UK, for example, broadcasting rights were seen as our, our UK competitive advantage. We're able to receive lots of money from wealthy broadcasters, which can then um, lead to clubs being able to pay more for wages and transfer fees. And clubs like Porto and Benfica and others and South American clubs would partner with particular companies, um, de-risk the potential transfer um, and then be able to then transfer players on where the club and the investor would necessarily win on the increase in value. Now, there's that delicate balancing line. Before the ban came into play, there was actually talk of regulating the practice rather than banning it outright. But ultimately, FIFA decided against that, in part, perhaps, because it would have been extremely difficult to regulate and very resource intensive, it's fair to say. Um, and it means that that ban is still in place six years on. The, the only iteration of that ban has been in a couple of decisions whereby Previously, it was considered that a player could not own their future economic rights or a portion of their economic rights. They now, according to the FIFA uh, regulations, can. So we've seen instances where players in an employment contract can be entitled to a percentage of a future transfer fee uh, if that player was to move on from a particular club. Uh, but at the moment, that doesn't look like there's too much ground for um, changing that, that fee for prohibition. It seems pretty set in stone. Famous last words, now they go and change it. But that, that's, what it, that's what it sounds like from, from my side. Okay, thank you very much uh, for clarification. But uh, don't you think? Uh, don't you think that uh, with the last approach FIFA adopted, I mean, uh, if the player, uh, if the uh, future transfer fee is being paid directly to a player as his contribution, it's uh, not as a, it, it's not being considered uh, as a violation of TPO. So basically, don't you think that this is a gap to for clubs to act in bad faith? and just formalize everything to be directly paid to player. But in, in truth, this uh, player can have an agreement with his partners, I don't know, agents, and just give the amount to them. I mean, this is a gap, really. So uh, what do you think on this uh, part? It's a very astute point you make, and it's something that I've talked about to authorities and to players in particular in the past is that that would be a breach of the, the regulations and would cause quite significant disciplinary issues for the player. Um, and that's where I'm always concerned about the player's welfare in truth, because ultimately it's the player that would be on the hook, not the side agreement that the player would have with another party in case something like that happened. So you're, you're totally right. Um, that is a major risk area. And it's something that FIFA or the national authorities wouldn't necessarily see because it would be a private side agreement. Um, and that's, that's been my concern for, for some time is the truth. So it's a yeah, great question. Thank you for that, Ashot. Thank you too for clarification and your opinion. Thank you very much. We've got a couple more questions coming to the um, question box as well. Just going to turn my light on. Sorry, it's a bit dark. No, okay. Looking through the um, question box, everyone seems to be really keen actually to make this some sort of a community thing, like with a, like a LinkedIn group. So that's certainly something mm. that I think we'll take forward um, as we discussed before and make a LinkedIn kind of community. Um, I know there's all different levels of experience here, but actually that can help everyone because the old, like the more senior people can help the younger ones. And I think it's just a good network to have um, across the board. So that's certainly something that um, Dan and I or, or, or I will look into for sure. Um, Hamad, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question to Dan, that'd be great. Now, we appreciate you taking the, the time out to you know do this every month with us. And there's a, there's a lot more people than last time. There's around 50 <laughs> people in here. Yeah. There's only about seven of us before, so I feel a bit nervous. Um, but yeah, I've just got um, a couple of things that I'm going to mention before I ask my question. Um, uh, one thing that I would really recommend to people who are um, starting out is the YouTube thing that Daniel put up. That was also something that I experienced. And 
it was my first exposure of um, sort of real sports law. Someone in the space was giving. That's um, a series I'd really recommend looking at. Um, a good question was about NFTs. Now, um, I've ju- I was just going to point out the the influence of certain people on NFTs. For example, um, Elon Musk is someone who's really been able to, in a way, without doing manipulate the market by simply tweeting about the crypto market. And I think that's something that was um, is very interesting. Now, if you don't mind, my question is going to be a bit more career based. Um, Obviously, as you know, we're, we're in a, a pandemic at the minute and it's been really hard to sort of get anything that's face to face with anyone, uh, you know, any sort of solicitors or anything like that. And uh, this is the, the best that we've got. Do you think that um, people graduating, let's say, in the next two years, firms will, firms will take that into consideration in terms of looking at CVs when they say that, look, people will note that really the only sort of... Um, work experience they've had is really Zoom sort of face-to-face sessions as that's really the only thing that's viable in this sort of environment. I'm going to jump in here just because (laughs) I have just because I have like quite up-to-date kind of exposure to this so um, yeah farmers will definitely take this into consideration Um, what I think is key and what I had to do um, at this point was um, you obviously can't control what's happening in the world around you absolutely that's out with your control but what you can control is your attitude towards it so it's what you can do so yeah you're right there's no um work experience per se you can't go into the office but there's things that you can do i.e networking on linkedin you know send someone a connection request but my point of that would be as well don't just send a generic um, network request like actually put their name you know see if you know a bit about them and ask if you can connect and things like that and just say you know can if you've got a spare 15 minutes can i call you for a chat something like that just more about human interaction and human connection Uh, i would definitely recommend doing that Also attending as many webinars or conferences as you can as possible. Um, And for me as well, um, what um, I did is I started a blog, um, which was way outside my comfort zone. And it's something I never thought I would do. And um, it was just really for my interest and things like that, as uh, of articles I read. And I just started publishing them, putting them out there and people would would see them. So there's certainly things that... um, Employ- future employers will take into account of course covid is a thing that nobody foresaw coming but your attitude to what you've done and what you will do and what you can bring um will be taken into account for for sure and i'm sure dan can confirm and vouch for that too it's it you you read my mind on everything there which is uh, which is great um and i also would say i hope you don't mind me saying um jody was telling me about um uh, a variety or one particular interview um, and in that interview they specifically mentioned um, your blog that you had you'd written and I, I really like that because not only is that great um, proactivity on Jody's part but most importantly you're showcasing your proactivity, um, your drafting ability, your knowledge um, your skill, your interest in the particular sector, rather than just saying I have a passion for it, is I like it, or I'm curious about it, etc. And I think that's the most important thing. I, I think um, ultimately it's uh, it's words and actions. Um, and when I mean words and actions, I mean it's tangible stuff that you can show people that you've done. Um, now, if it's not the physical stuff of work experience in the rest the next best because we've all been literally living in this digital world for the last year or so and more is what digital footprint have you left? And I think it's a really important point, which is, you know, have you gone to these conferences? What have you got out of them? Have you um, read a couple of articles a day on particular things? Have you thought about doing a blog? Have you thought about reviewing someone's book on something or otherwise, or your experiences or whatever else it might be? I'm not saying you have to, um, you know, have your ego attached to um, look, look how great I am and all the cool stuff that I'm doing. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is it's really important to showcase your talents in a, um, in a, a, a humble but proactive way to demonstrate to whoever it is you're trying to positively impress that you're in it for the long haul and you've actually done proactive things that you think will be of benefit to that organisation. If I could just come in there just to add on to what Daniel's saying, uh, um, and I agree totally with what Jody's saying, it's how you look at it, it's how you 
deal with the situation. I, I say to quite a lot of my the younger colleagues that we're dealing with it when you're trying to develop their networking skills that COVID's actually been somewhat of a blessing. It turns what used to be quite a cold way of approaching people, whether it be via LinkedIn or emails as opposed to at events into a much more acceptable way of approaching people. So, so use it to your advantage, but don't be the usual generic um, uh, way of, of, of approaching people. You Use it, um, personalise it in unique ways. But, but that is certainly it's actually an advantage, especially to, to younger people coming into the profession who there's so many more people now looking for jobs or looking for networking opportunities that um, you've got to use everything that you can do. And, but, but certainly I think COVID's actually turned it into to a positive in that respect. Yeah, I totally agree again, 100%. Yeah, yeah. thank you. No, thanks, Graham. Thank you. Thanks so much for the question. Um, Jodie, how are we doing for time? Any more? I'm, I'm happy yeah, to a little bit longer, but it's just really making sure not no, everyone else is bored, basically. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a couple more that have, um, that have come in. So if everyone's happy to stay for another five minutes or so, we'll just go through these two questions and then we yeah. can, can wrap up. Um, so there's um, Ali, if you want to unmute yourself and ask Dana's question. Hello, Dan. Hello, Jodie. Thanks for today. Um, just a quick question. This is more on the networking side of things. Like the reason why I want to get into sports law is because predominant, like, well, in particular, I see a lot of like, I see so much potential within certain communities that within, say, like Asian or Arab communities that they don't really emphasize sports compared to other communities. And there's yet yeah, there's such a high number of people in this country who are from such communities. How would you recommend that I go about, you know, networking and actually building um, effective uh, relationships that would eventually translate into potential clients? Because I'm I'm from those minorities and I speak the languages, so but I so I want to help bridge my legal background as well as my passion for sports into something that actually works. How do you recommend I go about that? You, you don't already realise the advantage that you have, and I mean that in a really positive way. Um, it's all about um, how to put this. What what you have to do is develop your hook. And when I mean hook, what I mean is, um, so I'm just going to get you on on uh, on uh, on spotlight so I can I can see hopefully as well. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, perfect. Um, you've got to be able to tell people and you've got to make sure people remember what you do and how you can help. And you do that by starting um, speaking to people within your community about what you do and how you can help. And if, for example, just like in, uh, in my community, I'm, I'm Jewish, um, we've got a strong community base as well to a degree. Um, not like everyone doesn't, but what I mean is it's like, you, you know, we have that identity as well. Yeah. Um, what becomes really important is the strength of your community, the strength of your advocates, the strength and bonds that develop by people, your uncle, your brother, your cousin, your sister, your friends, becoming your advocates and saying, oh, you know what? Ali's this lawyer that wants to do sports stuff. Actually, you should chat to him about this. And by doing so, you do, almost two things happen. One is when that hook develops so that everyone says, Ali's the lawyer that can help with that. And so everybody's saying, you're saying to everybody, I'm the lawyer that can help with that. If that, if you are a lawyer, so I think that's just no, no, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get into law. I've done LPC, so I'm yeah. trying to get into law. And exactly, then what happens is you've already got an already self-contained network that then grows and builds as a result. And so, what happens then in time is you providing value to others when they say, Ali, I don't know about this contract or Ali, I don't know about this thing that's gone on. Can you help? Those bonds and barriers or rather those bonds and those solutions become more ingrained. People tell other people, you become an advocate for certain things. You have an internal and an external persona and a profile. It, it builds and builds and builds so that in the end, other people are becoming your advertising mechanism in a positive okay, way. Okay, I see what you mean. So what in a way you've got to do, 
you've got to tell your mum and dad and your brothers or sisters or your cousins or your friends that it's like, I am going to be a sports lawyer. You can be different people to different things is the truth, yeah, always. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I want to be the sports lawyer. I want to network with these people so that when all of those people are then having conversations with all of the people that they're having conversations with, they're saying, my son, my, da my, my daughter, my nephew, my niece, my friend, my um, other half, you need to speak. This is what they are doing. And I'm so proud of them for doing this. And then it builds exponentially and exponentially and exponentially. But the issue is, is that it's difficult to do overnight. In fact, it's impossible to do overnight. And it's impossible to do over a year. And it's impossible to do over a couple of years, possibly. But if you build the foundation and it compounds day after day after day after day after day after day, the invisible stuff that everybody see doesn't see, because it's invisible, when it actually... Um, convert into things that actually happen and everybody says to you Ali how did you manage to be this really successful person that did this and this and this you'll say to them but look this isn't the point what you didn't see is all of this other stuff that I've been doing for a decade yeah that I can't there's no point explaining because it's so detailed and so but let me let me begin to try and explain to you how actually I went about doing bits of it yeah Okay, no, that makes sense. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Sorry if that was a bit pep talky, but no, 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 at all, not at all. I, I like for someone experienced uh, such as yourself to give me advice. It's invaluable. Can't put a price on it. So thank you. Great. Well, thank no. Thanks for the question. It was a, it was a great one. Thank you. Let's do one more. I'm just conscious of everyone's time, and then I think Jody afterwards will will sort of get that community thing going on. Uh, yeah, on, I'm happy to. To do that i think i think a lot of people have connected with me on linkedin anyway just due to the, the the event so i can kind of just put everyone together in a group i'm more than happy to do that um and if anyone else just wants to connect with me on linkedin as well like no problem at all um the, the last one i think i just because i've just seen it is from steve um conley and it just says for both of us how difficult is it to enter into a practice area like sports law and i think what which is what you said right at the start i think you've got to be a good lawyer first before branching in but nothing's impossible is what I would say everything's possible it's yeah kind of and and I think ultimately there's different ways of doing it you don't yeah. necessarily have to from day one be a sports lawyer by doing everything um you know for the best part of half a decade I called myself a sports lawyer but I was only doing some sports law work I was doing loads of work across lots of sectors which innately benefited me whereas now the truth is I call myself a sports and football lawyer, but there is sometimes work that I'm doing on NFTs. There's sometimes work I'm doing on um, film production stuff. There's sometimes work I'm doing on different types of intellectual property and disputes. So, you know, um, I, I can I can be different things to different people. But in the end, my core competency of the law in its different facets um, ultimately stays the same and hopefully hopefully develops. Yeah, totally agree. Um, well, just to wrap up, um, I kind of I hope everyone found this this webinar um, really useful. Our um, aim is to do the session once a month, so provisionally, um, the next one is booked in for the twenty first of April, um, which is a Wednesday, um, at half past five. But I'll put out emails and um, like LinkedIn posts as well, just to remind people. Um, but yeah, so thanks very much for attending. Um, I really enjoyed this kind of conversational um, hour, and I hope you all have too. And yeah, if you've got any other questions to follow up with, just email me. Um, or Dan or whatnot and we can take things from there but thanks very much for tuning in. Thank thanks you Jody, you. thank you Daniel, it's been a pleasure, thanks very much thank indeed and pleasure to meet everybody as well, thank you. Take care. No worries, thank you.